Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Independent Thought. My name is Desmond Price. For today's episode, we have James Eichner, the co-founder of Sana Packaging. James, how are you doing today? Thank you for coming on the show. I'm great. How about yourself? Good, good. Thank you for coming on today. You know, I I reached out uh, to you a couple months ago after I had done an episode on my podcast about, you know, just cannabis and climate change and how it, you know, how these things are kind of intertwined. And you kind of agreed to come on the podcast and talk about the hemp industry with me. So I'm very appreciative of that. Uh, before we get into some of the like more like deep questions about the industry, can you just tell us a little bit about what exactly, you know, like is your company and why did you decide to start it? Absolutely. Um, so Sana Packaging is a sustainable packaging brand that designs and develops cannabis packaging using plant-based, reclaimed, and recycled materials. Our mission is to reduce the impact of single-use packaging in the cannabis industry, and our vision is to ultimately transition cannabis packaging from a linear uh, take-make-dispose model towards a circular model that's meant to uh, eliminate waste and pollution, keep products and materials in use, and regenerate our natural systems. And in terms of uh, how and why we started the company, uh, my business partner, Ron, and I, we met in grad school at CU Boulder and uh, became friends, ended up taking a lot of classes together. And uh, one of the things we bonded over was we were both uh, passionate cannabis consumers, uh, but one of the uh, large negative externalities that we saw the legal industry uh, which at the time was fairly new to Colorado, um, we saw, you know, one of these big negative externalities was all the packaging waste being created by the industry. So we started just as frustrated consumers. Uh, neither of us had a background in packaging, but we were studying business and uh, we thought it would be a fun idea to uh, do a class project that kind of explored cannabis packaging and why it was the way that it was. And as the, these things happen, uh, you know, it just kind of snowballed and uh, here we are five or six years later. Right, right. So I, I was fascinated by this because, you know, like after hearing a little bit more about, you know, the hemp industry, because I've heard about hemp in the past and as far as like all the different uses it has, and it, it's kind of mind boggling all the different applications it can take. And so I was fascinated learning a little bit more about it. But, you know, for you, particularly as someone who is going into, you know, a business, why specifically hemp and not like another like plant-based material? And could you specifically talk to also what are like PLAs? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, at the very beginning, uh, when we were starting Sana Packaging, the, the first thing we wanted to do was explore plant-based uh, alternatives to uh, petroleum-based plastics. And most uh, plant-based plastics out there are PLAs, which are uh, polylactic acids, and it's basically just a polymer like uh, regular plastic, except that instead of being derived from petroleum, it's derived from a plant. Um, most PLA in the United States, however, is, is derived from corn. Um, which is, you know, certainly better than petroleum, but given the way corn is monocropped and subsidized, um, we don't, uh, it, it's not the most sustainable uh, crop, uh, especially the way we, we cultivate it here in the United States. And so when we, you know, first started exploring these plant-based materials, we quickly realized that well, pretty much everything available is PLA and pretty much all PLA in the United States is, is made from corn. So is there a way we could reduce the amount of uh, corn that we're using? Uh, and that's kind of how we came upon hemp. Um, at the time, uh, hemp was uh, recently legalized in the state of Colorado um, and in a few other uh, states as well. And you know, the way we're, the way we thought about it is hemp really uh, has the potential to be an ideal feedstock um, for bioplastics and plant-based plastics. Um, however, it, it should be noted that um, at the time and even now currently, 
uh, no one's really deriving uh, polymers directly from the hemp plant the way uh, a PLA is derived directly from corn. So right now, uh, most of the hemp plastics on the market are uh, biocomposites, meaning that a, um, uh, a fiber is being used to reinforce an existing polymer. So um, you could do this with any kind of polymer. So there's a lot of hemp plastics out there that are actually just petroleum-based polymers being reinforced with hemp. Um, some uses of that are uh, in car manufacturing, for instance. Um, I know brands like uh, Mercedes and BMW uh, use hemp in their um, the interior paneling of the cars. Um, and that's an example of it being mixed with uh, petroleum-based polymer. Um, of course, we wanted our material to be all plant-based. So uh, we um, combined hemp and PLA and the most hemp we are able to get into our material uh, for it to still work in the production uh, scale molds that we use is about 30%. So the material we use is 30% hemp and 70% PLA. And of course, uh, we're, not, we're not material compounders, so we're not the ones making the materials. We just source them and use them in our packaging. Uh, but we're very much looking forward to the day when uh, polymers are being derived directly from the hemp plant, because that's when I think that uh, hemp plastics will really take off. Um, and, you know, these, these uh, biocomposites, they have fairly limited um, use cases. Right. So that's actually exactly where I want to go to next, is that I know that the industry is kind of facing some challenges right now. You know, specifically, we you had mentioned in the past that, um, you know, certain packaging can't be used because it has like drug residue on it. Can you tell me a little bit more about like that and some of the other like uh, challenges your industry right now is facing as you're trying to move forward with this? Yeah, yeah. Cannabis packaging has a ton of really interesting challenges um, as we think about, you know, what does the road towards circularity for cannabis packaging look like? Um, and, uh, regulatory challenges are, are a large part of it. Um, so even something as basic as recycling cannabis packaging can be very difficult. Um, you can have, uh, a piece of cannabis packaging that is, um, you know, 100% recyclable, uh, made from a, you know, number one or a number two plastic. Um, but there's a chance that, uh, where you live is, is a state or a municipality where the MRFs there uh, don't, are, are kind of afraid to interact with cannabis packaging because it is not yet federally legal. So, you know, from, from the perspective of, you know, the recyclers, they see it as a potential liability and, you know, that for lack of a uh, better term, uh, used cannabis packaging has drug residue on it. Um, so for many years in, in Colorado, uh, you actually weren't able to recycle cannabis packaging and, um, our CEO and my business partner, Ron was a part of the uh, working group in Colorado that helped get that changed so that we can, you know, recycle it to begin with. Um, so there's, yeah, there's a ton of unique challenges like that. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, this is something that you've brought up a couple of different times now, but I guess just for the sake of explaining exactly what this means. What is the difference between, I guess, our current um, economy and what, you're, is what you refer to as a linear economy and what you're trying to transition towards, which is like a circular economy? Yeah, so a linear economy is, is basically how everything has uh, worked for um, you know, mu much of uh, our lives and you know, for the history of the economy in general. And that's you know, that it's, it's kind of a linear take, make, dispose model. Um, whereas in a circular model, you try to close that loop. Um, and the three primary tenets of a circular economy are to uh, eliminate waste and pollution, keep products and materials in use and regenerate our natural systems. And I think one of the specifically concerning packaging, uh, one of the easiest um, examples to point to, to to a circular packaging model would be, um, sort of the old 
uh, milkman model where uh, you'd have a glass bottle of milk delivered, you would drink the milk, and then you would leave your glass bottle out and it would be collected, refilled, and uh, redistributed. Um, and then, of course, once that glass bottle starts to uh, break down and no longer be usable, uh, that's the point at which you would then recycle it into another glass bottle. So, you know, when we think about cannabis packaging, um, there really should be, you know, given that it's a lot of standard form factors, um, you know, there's really no reason why in theory, uh, a model like that wouldn't make sense that you should be able to keep, you know, collecting, cleaning and reusing uh, a piece of packaging until it starts to break down, at which point then you recycle it into uh, a new piece of packaging. Um, so that's kind of, I, th I think, you know, probably one of the clearest and simplest ways to, to explain it. Perfect. Thank you so much. And you know what? Uh, we're going to take a quick break, but before we come back, or when we come back, we're going to be talking about a couple more topics, including, you know, just exactly the environmental impact of this packaging. And it wouldn't be a political podcast if we weren't talking about how the government's involved at in all of this. So we'll be right back after this quick break. <laughs> Welcome back from the break, everyone. Thank you for sticking with us for this episode of Independent Thought. So before the break, I kind of teased the fact that we had to talk a little bit more about, you know, the government, sustainability, you know, things that are vital topics, you know, when we talk about political discourse as far as, as well as, you know, things that I've just touched on recently with this podcast. But, you know, first I want to touch on environmental impact. You know, what exactly is the environmental impact of your product? And is that something that you are taking into account when you are thinking about, you know, packaging in general? Yeah, definitely. And, and this can be, you know, um, like all sustainability uh, topics, it's, it's often about trade-offs. Um, you know, you can make a case for or against pretty much any type of packaging material, depending on what metric um, you're looking at. Um, so, you know, we specifically work primarily with um, plant-based hemp plastic, as well as a variety of ocean-bound and reclaimed ocean plastics. And before getting into, you know, the, the specific uh, impact we've been able to have, I feel like it's always really important to preface um, anything that we say like, uh, you know, around the positive impact that we've been able to have by uh, saying that, you know, we by no means uh, believe that we have put out a, a silver bullet or uh, a perfect solution. It's, it's all about these incremental steps uh, towards circularity and we, and we still have um, a long ways to go. Um, but to date, we've We've been able to um, reclaim over uh, 193 tons of ocean-bound ocean plastic. And, and the way we look at these materials uh, is uh, we view them as stranded resources. So, you know, they've escaped our uh, waste streams and are in the environment. So, um, you know, we view being able to uh, take these materials out of the environment and put them back into the marketplace, give them a second life, and then also hopefully uh, then back into the proper waste stream. Um, we see that as a, you know, pretty significant uh, positive impact. Um, we've also used over 80 tons of uh, plant-based hemp plastic. So, that's you know 80 tons of uh, packaging material uh, that has been transitioned uh, away from uh, virgin petroleum-based resins to plant-based resins. Um, so we see that as a, a pretty big net positive as well. Um, and then uh, these next few metrics are um, kind of looking at the impact of, of both our uh, ocean bound and reclaimed ocean plastic materials and our plant-based hemp plastic materials together. Uh, but we've been able to uh, sequester or avoid uh, more than 222 tons of carbon. And we've also been able to save over uh, 958,000 kilowatt hours of energy. 
Uh, and when we look at things like uh, carbon sequestered or avoided, um, the ways we calculate that um, are by looking at, uh, for instance, like A, how much you know, does an acre of hemp sequester uh, as it's being grown? And then also, um, you know, what is the carbon savings of uh, using a uh, reclaimed and recycled material uh, versus a virgin material? Uh, and same thing with the kilowatt hours of, of energy saved. Um, another thing that we don't have, um, you know, specific metrics on, but is kind of core to our ethos is the localization of packaging. Yeah. Um, so all of our packaging is uh, manufactured domestically. Uh, our supply chains are predominantly uh, North American. And while we don't have specific metrics around this, you know, we do believe uh, in, you know, for instance, if, if we were expanding into Europe, let's say, if, if we were selling uh, the packaging that we produce here in the United States in Europe, uh, I think it'd be fair to say that pretty much all of the sustainability benefits of our packaging would be lost the second we ship it overseas. Uh, just from a carbon perspective. So, um, you know, we have different uh, regionalized manufacturers across the country that we use. Um, and if and when we do expand to, you know, another continent, it would be kind of core to our business belief that um, we would have to localize the um, production and supply chains of uh, those products in those regions. Right. You know, that's actually, you know, something that I, I want to kind of pivot off of right now, because, you know, so often when we're having this conversation, I, I think like right now, as far as uh, just businesses, you know, having more of a, I guess, like an environmental like impact on the planet and, you know, like their, I guess their role, you would say in helping the planet, you know, be more sustainable. We are seeing, so much, I guess, like devastation come at the hands of like, like major forms of capitalism. Mm -hmm. What you are talking about right now is being more environmentally conscious as you are growing your business, which there are a lot of people believe that just that can't happen in our current economy. Tell me like, why was that so important to you to kind of like maintain, you know, this level of, I guess you would say integrity as you're like expanding your company? Um, I mean, I guess, um, I don't know. I, th I think maybe some of it just has has to do with um, my business partner and I's, you know, kind of just our kind of core core ethos, uh, for for lack of a better better word. You know, we didn't really get into this for the money, um, and you know, kind of when you think about it, if if we were to really succeed in our uh, vision, we would to an extent be putting ourselves out of business because we are a business that ultimately, you know, produces and sells a widget, which is a piece of packaging. And, and our vision is to reduce the impact of that widget. And part of it is by using less of it and reusing it. So, um, you know, I don't have like a, a clear answer to, um, you know, how, how we would um, I guess, what am I trying to say here? Like a clear answer around, um, it's a, it's an ever evolving business model. Um, and I think that if we know that we want to be part of the solution, we'll, we'll figure out how to, uh, keep ourselves afloat and profitable, uh, by, by doing that. Um, but it, it, it was interesting to, you know, hear you say like, you know, that so many of these, sustainability issues that we're in it's like how do you kind of reconcile that with um you know being a scaling company and and one of the things i think about a lot is um you know the whole idea of uh producer responsibility and consumer responsibility and i just remember being absolutely shocked when um because you you hear you know you hear folks all the time talk about you know well what's your you know, personal carbon footprint or like, what are things you can do to reduce your carbon footprint as, as an individual? 
Um, and I was shocked to learn that the whole idea of consumer responsibility was uh, basically invented by uh, oil and gas in the 80s as kind of a way to deflect uh, responsibility from the oil and gas industry onto the consumer. So um, I believe it, it was either Shell or kind of British Petroleum, one of those two that did the first big um, consumer responsibility campaign, uh, kind of putting all that responsibility onto the individual. Um, and, you know, we're just firm believers in producer responsibility because, you know, there's, there's a ton of reasons why it's unfair to put that responsibility onto the individual. And, and I think with things like sustainability, it often comes down to, you know, price points. So like, if you're thinking of groceries or something, right, like not everyone can afford to buy organic. Um, and so from that standpoint, well, it's kind of unfair then that the sustainable choice when grocery shopping is not financially available to everyone that's grocery shopping. And you can kind of apply that thinking to, you know, uh, all different industries. And I think the only real solution to that problem is to, you know, not have the worst alternative to begin with. Um, and yeah, so I, I, do think that um, even though some of these things uh, are a result of uh, big business, uh, I also think that big business taking responsibility is, is probably the quickest and easiest way to, um, if not solve these problems, at least alleviate them uh, and you know get a lot of the way towards solving them. Okay. So here's my final question for you. You know, what exactly, you know, could the U S government be doing to help this industry as far as allowing it to advance further? By this industry, do you mean uh, hemp specifically or hemp and cannabis or kind of both? Both. Both. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, when thinking about um, industrial hemp um, and hemp as an input for industrial goods, um, I think hemp should be subsidized. Um, and I think that corn should not. <laughs> of course, there's so much uh, money tied up into all of this that it's, it's not a flip you can switch overnight, but you know, I think if, if the government were serious about supporting hemp as a sustainable alternative um, and uh, sustainable feedstock uh, compared to a lot of other materials, then I think the logical thing would be to uh, subsidize uh, hemp production uh, to help the industry uh, grow more quickly and build the um the resilience that it needs um, from an infrastructure standpoint. And then with cannabis, I mean, it's, cannabis is also a tough one. Um, I think from a, from a packaging perspective, um, and this is more on, you know, because cannabis now is kind of a state by state issue. It's not really a, a federal thing yet. Um, but one thing that all state markets have in common is the uh, child resistance requirements for cannabis packaging, which um, can make it very hard to use uh, more sustainable materials, uh, just given the, the complexity associated with the locking mechanisms, et cetera, um, you know, makes it, it can make it difficult to use sustainable materials. Uh, and a recent study that came out of um, McGill University in Canada showed that if uh, the cannabis industry got rid of child resistance requirements for non-activated products, so here it's important to distinguish between activated and non-activated products, an activated product would be like a, a cannabis edible um, where, you know, the product's already activated. If, if a child were to eat an edible, they would get high. Um, but 
uh, non-activated products are um, like just cannabis flour or a pre-roll. Uh, you know, if, if a child were to eat uh, a nug of weed, uh, guess what? Nothing's going to happen uh, other than they'll just have a bunch of, you know, plant material in their mouths um, that probably doesn't taste really good. Uh, but it poses no danger. Um, and so this study showed that if the industry got rid of uh, child resistance requirements for non-activated products, so things like flour and pre-rolls, that the industry could reduce its packaging waste by upwards of 75%, which is astounding. That That's very astounding. And I, I think the, you know, just a very, just quick yes or no answer. Do you think that it would be in the best interest of like the hemp industry and, you know, just packaging industry in general, if the federal government legalized, you know, cannabis across the entire nation. Yes. Uh, but I think, you know, it's, it's a lot more complicated than that because, um, you know, as we've seen with the different state markets, there's been a number of different approaches to legal cannabis and legal hemp and, uh, some of these approaches have been more equitable than others, uh, and some have been drastically less equitable than others. Um, and I guess what I would hate to see is for, uh, you know, it to happen very quickly in a way that kind of negated looking at the whole picture and kind of doing it right. Um, and there's, you know, this could manifest itself in like different ways, but I would, uh, you know, I would, I would hate to see cannabis immediately become just big business where, you know, mom and pop legacy operators that have been at it, you know, for several generations just immediately get pushed out in lieu of corporate cannabis. Obviously, you know, there's going to be some of that, um, just because of the nature of, of the way our economy works. But um, yeah, so I, I guess this is all to say that, you know, I really want to see federal legalization, but uh, every time I, you know, kind of read a, a new bill or proposal or something, I just very quickly find myself kind of seeing all the flaws in that particular uh, legalization bill. And I, I don't know what the answer is, but I just uh, would, would like to see it done in a way that uh, A, respects uh, those that have been uh, negatively impacted by the war on drugs, uh, B, in a way that, you know, respects um, these legacy growers and farmers that have dedicated their lives to this plant who, you know, now in states like California and Oregon are are really having a hard time making ends meet because of just you know the the crazy market pressures of the cannabis industry, um, and and yeah, so I, I would just like to see folks focus on that uh, with federal legalization. Okay, well, James, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast today. I really do appreciate it. Can you just let everyone know where they can find out a little bit more about your company and what it is that you guys are trying to do? Yeah, um, best. Uh, I guess the best places for uh, folks to find us are uh, at our website, which is www.sanapackaging.com. And then also on Instagram, uh, just at Sana Packaging. Thank you so much. Well, thank you to everyone who came here. Check out this episode today. And we will have another guest episode next week. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, thank you to all subscribers and we will see you in the next episode. Thank you.